Preface to Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand, by Charlotte Evans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. In writing a story of New Zealand life, one great difficulty presents itself. It is a life which in its social aspects is continually altering as the country advances in prosperity and civilization. The colours in the kaleidoscope remain the same, but the pattern gradually changes. In writing this story, I had in my mind the New Zealand of some years ago, with which I first made acquaintance. Since then, much is altered. The land which lay waste and desolate is now fenced and under cultivation, and society has become more formal, and conforms more strictly to the rules in vogue in Europe. Charlotte Bronte says, at the end of one of her letters written on the continent to a friend at home, that it seems to her, while writing, as if the winds and waves of the channel must drown the sound of what she is saying. I, too, have the same odd fancy. Thinking of the mighty waste of waters which separates me from the home country, I feel tempted to exclaim, O oh, mighty ocean which divides us, hush your roar a while. O oh, wild winds, cease to moan, and let them hear my voice in England. End of Preface Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 1 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand, by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. On the Lewis Road. Brighton during the season, and about three o'clock on a glorious summer afternoon. The grand parade, a stream of carriages and riders so deep and rapid that Lucy Cunningham, after waiting vainly for several minutes for a chance to cross the road, gave it up in despair and pursued her way along the foot-pavement nearest the sea, hoping for better luck anon. She had some letters in one hand, and was intending to drop them into the first pillar letter-box she met with. There was one on the farther side of the road just opposite to her she knew, but at present she was cut off from it by the steady ebb and flow of chariots and horsemen. She comforted herself with the reflection that she had plenty of leisure time, and that her walk would be better prolonged, for it was the last walk she was to undertake in England until, who could say when? This was Monday. On Tuesday, she was going with her mother on board the Flora MacDonald, bound for Otago. Lucy Cunningham said to herself, as she sauntered down the Brighton Parade that afternoon, that with the morrow a new chapter in her life would begin. But she was wrong. It was to commence that day. This history does not concern itself with anything happening to Lucy previous to the time I now write of. Briefly and concisely, in as few words as possible, let me state how she came to take that last walk in Brighton when a fresh episode in her life opened out before her. She was then twenty-one, and her brother Lewis was eight years her senior. The last four he had spent in New Zealand with his father, and then he had taken a trip to England to fetch his sister, who had been educated at home, out to the colony. She had been brought up under the care of her two maiden aunts, who had, besides their house at Brighton, a beautiful little villa upon the banks of the Thames, between which residences they divided their time with extreme regularity. Lucy had not seen her father for seven years, for that period had elapsed since he had left England, so that he was almost a stranger to his only daughter. When she last saw him, she was standing with reluctant feet, where the brook and river meet, womanhood and childhood sweet. Now childhood had passed forever into the days that are no more, but Lucy was still in all the bloom of her first youth. Let me try to sketch her as she stands in this first chapter of my story, leaning over the railings of the esplanade, looking out not only at the blue waves of the channel, but also at the advancing tide of her life. A pretty girl, certainly, yet not uncommonly so. You may see fairer faces in the carriages passing by. A complexion more pale than rosy, not beautiful, yet not sallow. A mouth and nose of the same mediocre type, eyes not large but bright and clear, and a broad, intelligent forehead. Her hair was, with the exception of her graceful rounded figure, her one especial beauty. An artist would have loved its rich brown colour and its regular natural ripple. So too he would have approved of the picturesque mass in which, Lucy disdained hair pads or false plaits, it was gathered high upon her head, and set off with a blue ribbon. Lovely curly rings clustered full of golden lights upon the front of that natural crown, but no long falling tress or ringlet concealed the outline of the graceful neck and shoulders. Certainly that hair had been bestowed upon one who knew how to manage it and do it justice. The worst of it was, as Lucy herself used to say, that in these days of wigs and hair dyes people would not give her credit for her real true possession, but persisted in believing it to be false. My portrait is almost complete. 
It only remains to be added that Lucy was dressed, on the day we first met, like numbers of other English girls, in a pretty short walking costume of silvery grey luster, and with a little black high-crowned hat, adorned with a snow-white plume. She walked on for some time without making another attempt to cross the parade. She had by this time determined that she would find her way home through the town, and post her letters, farewells to one or two friends, on the way. Lewis, who had gone to London, would not be back until seven o'clock, and they were not to dine until then. The tide was coming in, the sky was without a cloud, and the air was only freshened by a faint breeze from the sea. The dark blue waters heaved languidly in the summer afternoon. Lucy, in her heart, was bidding goodbye to it all, but not too sorrowfully. She was very young, and she fully intended to come back and visit it all again some day. In the town she made a few purchases, last additions to her outfit, and managed, with a forgetfulness for which she felt provoked with herself, to pass the general post office without once thinking of her letters. She only remembered them when she was halfway home, and the incident that recalled them to her mind was this. Turning the corner of a quiet by-street, which she knew would lead her back to the parade, she saw, lying on the pavement before her, a letter face downwards. She took it up. It was sealed and stamped, and directed in a lady's hand, clear and good, to R. Dacre, Esquire, M.D., 301 Citadel Road, Plymouth. It had been lying on a dusty square of stone, and was slightly soiled from its contact therewith. There was not a single person visible in the street, and Lucy looked at the envelope in her hand, feeling for a moment rather puzzled. Then she determined to slip it into the nearest letterbox with her own. It was quite ready for posting, and the probabilities were that it had been dropped on the way to the post office by its bearer. She walked on with a few vague speculations in her mind as to the probable contents of this letter. Would she be assisting to make or to mar some small romance by posting it? Or did it merely concern some prosaic, important matter of business? In the next street which Lucy entered there was, as she knew, a chemist's shop, which was also a post office. As she turned the corner of the street, she saw that there was, standing by the letterbox, a tall lady whose back was towards her. A black grenadine shawl, a black dress, and a black bonnet with violet flowers. That was all she could see. But, as she approached, the tall, sombre figure turned round, and Lucy saw a handsome face with an expression of such blank dismay and perplexity that she actually started. Could this be the owner of the lost missive? She held it towards the stranger with the words, I have just found this lying in the road. Does it belong to you? You are the first person I have seen since. The large eyes looking down at her, Lucy was rather below the medium height, and this lady was above it, lost their troubled expression. The lady in black smiled, took the letter quickly, and dropped it into the box before her. It belonged to me, she said. I must have let it fall as I came along. What a lucky chance I met you. I am much obliged to you for returning it to me. It was of importance. It was an important letter, truly, but it never reached the person to whom it was addressed. Had it done so, this story would never have been told. But he had already left Plymouth. The dead letter office took possession of it, opened it, and found in it no clue to the writer. Consequently, it was doomed to annihilation. But it deserves mention here, because, though it failed to fulfil the errand on which it was dispatched, and died dumb to the only one who could have understood its words, Yet it was the accidental cause of first bringing together two women who were destined to exercise a vast influence on each other's lives. At this, their first meeting, neither made any great impression on the mind of the other. Lucy said to herself, She is handsome, decidedly so, but she looks as if she had a temper, and besides, she's rather faded. I wonder what that letter was about. The other, after her few hurried words of explanation to Lucy, made her a farewell gesture and turned away. Her thought was, a pretty baby face with no character about it. Nice hair. I should recognize her again by that more easily than by anything else. She was walking away towards the end of the street, and presently she turned the corner. As she did so, she looked back, but Lucy was gone. She had gone into the chemist's shop to make some small purchase. They did not see each other again just yet. Lucy went home and found her brother Lewis waiting for her. He was a good-looking man with a fair beard and quiet, reserved manners but for the present we must leave them and follow the steps of the lady in black. She walked quickly, and as one who knew her way about Brighton well. Street after street she entered and left behind her, until at last the houses grew fewer in number, and the gay, busy part of the town was past. She was on the Lewis Road, and in a while she stopped at the gates of the cemetery which lies on the right-hand side as you leave Brighton. She passed under the archway and emerged on the gravel drive which leads up to the graves. Here she walked slower and with a more weary step. The tombs, among which is a great marble block with a medallion on two sides dedicated to the memory of Frederick William Robertson, she passed without a glance. She made her way, still slowly, but without pausing, 
to the higher and cheaper part of the burying ground, not the very cheapest, but the intermediate part. Here she sought out a grave. There was no stone on it, only grass, and at the head was placed a geranium. Of a distinguishing sign it had none. Beside the green mound she sat down. She was high up on the slope of the hill. Brighton lay at her feet. The white tombs below stood out in exquisite contrast with the green tints of the grass and the trees. The sunlight lay brilliantly over all, and the sea rippled in front, blue and calm. The solitary figure seated on the hillside had her eyes fixed upon the lovely view below, but her inward vision saw it not. Nothing interrupted her thoughts, whatever they were. There were two or three parties of visitors to the cemetery, but they were satisfied with examining the larger and more striking-looking tombs below. Not one of them came any higher. At some little distance from her, a man was busy painting the small iron railing round a baby's grave with dark green paint, but he was intent upon his work, and did not notice the woman seated by a mound on his right. It was not at all an uncommon sight there, so that no one saw a change pass gradually over the face of the motionless watcher on the hill. It was a very handsome face, and would be so most probably for some years to come, although the first bloom and softness of youth were past, and although at first its expression was one of utter weariness and indifference. But as the minutes flew by, slowly, very slowly, the pale cheeks began to flush with pink, and there rose and darkened in the great grey eyes a look of wrath. The man who was painting the green railing came at last to tell her that it was the hour when the cemetery was closed for the night. He thought, as he spoke to her, that the expression of her face was not pleasant. She got up, however, and when he had gone back to fetch his paint and brushes, she pulled a few leaves from the geranium at the head of the grass-covered mound. She had a bunch of charms hanging to her watch-chain. Into one of these, a large old-fashioned locket, she put the leaves, fastening the glass over them carefully, and then shutting the trinket with a firm snap. Two of the charms upon the cluster were remarkable, a wedding ring and its guard, a circle of dead gold set with three turquoises. After this, she walked slowly away. At that moment she felt, as did the girl in Jean Ingelow's beautiful ghostly poem Requiet Scut in Pace, after her vision, as she sat down on the Chroma Downs and looked out to sea. I rose up, I made no moan, I did not cry or falter, but slowly in the twilight I came to Chroma Town. What can ringing of the hands do that which is ordained to alter? He had climbed, had climbed the mountain, he would ne'er come down. End of chapter 1 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 2 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher Pages from Lucy's Diary on board the Flora MacDonald, July 27th, 1800-something. Yesterday, Lewis and I went on board the Flora MacDonald at Gravesend, and today we sailed, so I suppose I ought immediately to commence a diary of the voyage. Every one, I am told, begins one on first setting out, but people say it is very hard to find something to record every day at sea. I shall learn by experience if this is true or not. To begin then, with yesterday... It was rather a dull kind of day, and very hot, until in the middle of the day a breeze sprang up from the river. We dined in Gravesend, and went on board our ship just after the passengers who were already assembled had finished their dinner in the saloon. They were most of them on deck. Just as I stepped on board, a gust of wind blew off my hat. It was immediately captured and restored to me by a gentleman with a dark beard who was standing near. As I took my hat from him, I distinctly heard him mutter to himself, What beautiful hair! I felt myself grow scarlet, and was thankful to turn away to hide my hot cheeks, for the little scene had been so dramatic that it almost seemed as if I had lost my hat on purpose for the sake of effect. I had spirits enough to see the humorous side of everything, and indeed the day was not a sad one at all to Lewis and myself. This was chiefly, I think, because we had no especial friends to come and see the last of us. My aunts were not strong enough to attempt it, Lewis's friends are chiefly in New Zealand, and of my schoolgirl allies, not one could arrange matters so as to escort me to the ship. It was much better, and both Lewis and I were relieved at having got through all our farewells on terra firma. But pathetic little scenes were about us everywhere, and were taking place that day all over the ship from the wheel to the forecastle. In one corner I saw a poor old woman crying bitterly over her son, whom she never hoped to see again. A girl of my own age was lowered into a boat, looking as pale as death. As the boat pulled off, I saw that she had fainted, and her friends were trying to restore her so far in vain. Her lover was on board our ship. 
The ship's husband, as he is called, was on board, and the agent from Simpson and Seymour's, but not the captain, and no one seemed quite to know when he might be expected. At six o'clock we went down to a most uncomfortable tea in the saloon. Everyone sat in the wrong place and no one had any appetite. All the other first cabin passengers were at tea, and I may as well put down their names here. The stern cabin next to mine is taken by a young married couple, a Mr. and Mrs. Grant, and then comes my cabin, then Lewis's, then the doctor's. Opposite to him is the gentleman with the beard, whose name I have not yet learnt. Then comes a cabin belonging to a Mr. Lennox, who has a run in Otago, and is returning from a few months' visit to England. He is grave, grey-haired, and elderly, but with a pleasant, attractive face and manner. Then two ex-officers of the 200th, Mr. Pryor and Mr. Meredith, share a cabin between them, and the other stern cabin is taken by a Mrs. Mostyn, with her two children and nurse. She is going out to join her husband. The saloon party is completed with the captain and first mate, who take the head and foot of the table. After tea, we went up on deck again. It was utter misery and confusion. The doctor was reviewing the sailors on one side of the deck, and some of the second cabin passengers had pitched their camp stools and were actually trying to keep their heads sufficiently clear in the confusion as to admit of their studying cheap editions in very small type of the Waverley novels. It was a very hot night. The breeze died away again, and it became perfectly calm. Lewis and I went and leant over the bulwarks side by side, but were neither of us inclined to talk. A small steamer bound for Rotterdam passed us, and the people clustered like bees on her deck, waved their hats and handkerchiefs, and cheered the emigrant vessel. Some of us returned the salute. It began to grow dusk. When it was getting quite dark, and I was tired of watching the lamps quiver so far in the river, I went below. Sleep, as I imagined, would be out of the question in that small closet of a cabin, with such strange noises all about me, but I was dead tired and soon fast asleep. The last thing I remember is hearing someone standing close to my cabin door in the saloon say, Goodbye, Dacre. Dieu vous garde. I looked through the slides of my cabin ventilator and saw the bearded gentleman shaking hands with, apparently, a friend who was just leaving. Dacre? Dacre? Where have I heard that name lately? I cannot remember. The captain came on board late at night, and we sailed about four o'clock this morning. Grey dawn showed the water visible through my porthole, glassy smooth but turning green. After breakfast I went on deck. It was a lovely morning without a breath of wind. We were towed by a steam tug to Deal, where we anchored and waited for a breeze. Mr. Meredith, who was a very handsome, fair-haired man, introduced himself to Lewis, and they rapidly made friends, while Mrs. Grant and I showed each other some new patterns in tatting. If we had been setting forth on a picnic in a pleasure boat, we could not have had a more lazy, charming day of it, with novels and backgammon on deck. July 28th, Thursday. Sailed this morning. Another lovely day. At night, off Dungeness. July 29th. Our pleasant society has been quite broken up by the melancholy fact that almost all its members have succumbed to seasickness. There were several gaps at the breakfast table, and about ten o'clock Lewis broke down. He went below, leaving me on deck, fully determined never to give in. The first mate came to me as I stood by the door of the companion stairs leading from the saloon, and told me Beachy Head was in sight. I was wild for a last glimpse of the dear old Sussex coast, so he helped me to walk up the deck, and holding fast by one of the belaying pins, I looked at the distant coastline out of my opera glass. After a while a voice behind me said, You must be tired of standing. Shall I fetch your easy chair up here for you? I looked round. Dr. Dacre, with his telescope in his hand, was close to me, standing, in spite of the rolling of the vessel, with sufficient ease and firmness as to show that this was not the first time he had been to sea. Dr. Dacre is the gentleman whom I have mentioned in my diary before as the man with the beard. I should have added, and with the eyes, for his eyes are certainly uncommonly bright and handsome. For the rest, he looks about thirty, and has a pleasant face with a square forehead. But he is not nearly as good-looking as Mr. Meredith, who is by far our handsomest cabin passenger. I thanked Dr. Dacre, and he fetched my chair. Then, standing by my side, he said, No one has introduced us to each other, but considering that we are likely to be near neighbours for a good many weeks, I think I may venture to present myself. Your name is Miss Cunningham, I know, and mine is Rilston Dacre. We both bowed very gravely and formally in honour of the introduction, and then both laughed. And Dr. Dacre remarked, You seem to be a good sailor, Miss Cunningham. I told him this was my first voyage, and I was afraid to boast too soon. But you have been to sea before now, I am certain, I added. He asked me how I knew that. I said by the way he walked the deck. He smiled and said I was right. He had been accustomed to spend days on board a Plymouth trawler, 
and the motion of this large ship seemed nothing to him after that. Then, after a short pause, he told me that with his telescope he could see a thrashing machine on the downs near Beachy Head. I exclaimed, and he held the glass for me to look through. When I raised my head, I saw that he was gazing at the white cliffs with a face, the expression of which had clouded during the last moment or two. I know his look rather startled me, and he must have noticed that it did, for, catching my eye, he said, I was thinking of the last time I stood on the deck of an outward bound, and looked at those cliffs. Six years ago, it's a long time. I did not know what to reply to this, so I made no answer. He also held his peace and looked out darkly for a few moments at the distant coast. The blue waves of the channel were leaping and dancing all round us. A large Turkish vessel was passing us to leeward, and behind were the white chalk walls with glimpses of the green downland above. Do you know Sussex, Dr. Dacre? I asked, more by way of something to say than because I took the slightest interest in the answer I might receive. He shook his head. No, he said, I have never even entered that county. I have no association with it whatever. All my pleasantest English associations centre in Sussex, I said, and mine in Devonshire. I was beginning to grow intensely weary of the conversation. This tiresome man, I thought, will he never go away and let me read in peace? What do I care which county he likes best, or about his life six years ago? I was glad when the first mate, Mr. Bruce, came up, and began to talk to Dr. Dacre, who presently left me, and they walked up and down the deck together. I pondered for a minute or two on a subject that puzzles me. Where did I see or hear the name Dacre before I left England? I never knew anyone of that name. I must have read it somewhere, but where? And in connection with what subject? I cannot remember. Tired of worrying my memory, at last I took up my book again. It was The Mill on the Floss, and I was soon quite absorbed in the history of Maggie Tulliver and Stephen. End of chapter 2 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Chapter 3 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Pages from Lucy's Diary. In the afternoon, Lewis came on deck. He was pale and misanthropic. He said that life at present was a burden to him, and that the times were out of joint. He really was a trifle cross, but under the circumstances, I quite forgave him. July 30th, Saturday. A thick, gloomy day. Wind against us, and we were beating about all day off the Isle of Wight. Dr. Dacre and myself still the only survivors of the first cabin passengers. His face looked much brighter than yesterday, in spite of the weather, and he was kind enough to take me under his especial charge all day, wrapping me up in rugs and waterproofs from the wet mist, and carrying my easy chair about to one sheltered part of the deck after another as the vessel altered her course. He did not talk much, nor did I, but somehow I did not feel lonely with that rough-coated, broad-shouldered figure keeping guard over me at a little distance, and, upon the whole, the day passed pleasantly, though Lewis was still invisible. July 31st, Sunday. The captain read the morning prayers of the English church in the saloon, and most of the passengers, including Lewis, came to life again. August 1st, Monday. Today the pilot left us, and we had our last sight of the English coast. Devonshire faded away in the gloaming, and on Tuesday morning we saw only a sapphire sea on all sides. I have been looking back over the pages of my diary, and I find that I have written a good deal in it about Dr. Dacre. I scarcely know what is the reason of this, except that he and I have been, from the force of circumstances which neither of us could prevent, much in the other's society during the past week. And then, too, there is certainly something about him which I like. I should say he is a man who would gain a great influence over the people he saw much of. But he is very peculiar with it all, very odd indeed at times. If it would not sound too romantic and sentimental for anything but a young lady's diary, I should venture to suggest that he must have a story connected with his life. I must put down something which happened, trifling though it is, to show what gave rise to this theory in my mind. This evening, Tuesday, August 2nd, most of the passengers were on deck about tea time. It was a lovely evening, and a light wind quite in our favour was wafting us along swiftly and gently. I was playing backgammon with Mr. Meredith, who was certainly the handsomest man on board the Flora. Dr. Dacre was leaning over the bulwarks near us. He was lounging with that perfect grace with which some men can manage to do nothing, languor of the most fascinating kind because it is only strength dormant. Dr. Gray, the ship's doctor, one of the shortest and fattest of men, had been going his rounds among the invalids in the second cabin. He now came up the stairs from the single women's department, and making his way up the deck to the other doctor, 
leant over the bulwarks by his side and began to talk to him. One of the women down there is very ill, I heard Dr. Gray say. She's worse than any of them, and she seems a superior sort of person, too. I don't think I ever saw anyone handsomer in her way. Mr. Meredith was throwing doubles with truly remarkable luck, and I was struggling against adverse circumstances with no hope of winning. Perhaps, having resigned myself to losing the game, I was attending more to what was being said near me than I otherwise should have been. Dr. Dacre had turned around so that I could see his face. Has she got any friends on board, he asked, with not much interest in his tone. No, she is going out alone, to her brother, I think, she told me. She is very much above the women around her, really. Ah, is she young, this princess in disguise? About eight and twenty, I should say. Quite old enough to take care of herself. Handsome, you said? Very. Black hair and great grey eyes, but she's ill, you know. Ah, yes, so you said. There was certainly more alacrity now in Dr. Dacre's manner. What is her name, he asked. Mrs. Keith. She is a widow, then. Dr. Gray shrugged his shoulders. That's as may be, he said. I don't inquire into the family history of all my patients. There was a few moments' silence. I made my last throw and gave up the game. Mr. Meredith immediately challenged me to play again, and commenced to put the board in order for another. Dr. Gray was speaking again. She has given me her watch and begged me to ask the captain to take charge of it for her. They often do that, you know, if they don't think their fellow passengers are to be trusted. Here's the watch. She had a chain and a bunch of charms, too, but those she would not part with. Dr. Dacre took the watch in his hand. It was a pretty little hunting watch. One side was plain. The other had the letter L upon it in dark blue enamel. Turning it over on his palm, the doctor's countenance fell. There came over it the same expression which it had assumed when he looked at the Sussex cliffs, but intensified and mixed with... What? Was it terror? Then suddenly, for what reason I cannot tell, he looked full at me. This time there was another meaning in his eyes, but I could not read it. I had no clue to the mystery. He handed back the watch, and his hand did not tremble. I noticed that. A pretty little trinket, he said. I don't wonder she was afraid to lose it. It's nearly tea time, and I think I shall go below. End of chapter 3 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 4 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher Lucy's Diary, August 16th, Tuesday I have never touched my diary for a fortnight. So much for the good resolutions made at the commencement of the voyage, and I have nothing to plead in excuse except that it is too hot to write, too hot to exert one's mind in the least, too hot to do anything all day but recline on deck under an awning and amuse oneself after some very easy and luxurious fashion. Tennyson's Lotus Eaters becomes intelligible to me at last. It ought to be read for the first time in the tropics. What was I writing about before this great chasm occurred in my diary? Something about Dr. Dacre and a woman who has been very ill among the second-class passengers. We have never seen her yet on deck, and I feel rather curious about her, I confess. Is there a mystery connected with her, or is it all my fancy, I wonder? However it may be, I have not thought or seen much of Dr. Dacre lately. Somehow or other, he never comes in my way now. Once or twice I have been tempted to think that he purposely avoids me, but that is so very improbable that I really cannot believe it. What motive could he possibly have? A few days ago we were becalmed off Madeira about tea time. The island looked beautiful, with an exquisite rosy glow on the cliffs, and a white convent perched high on the side of the hill. Mr. Meredith has some cousins who live at Madeira, though at present they are on a visit to England. One or two of them are young ladies, and I gather from all he has said that he is a great admirer of them. He tried hard to make out their house from the descriptions he had received, but could not succeed even with the aid of the captain's telescope. Strangely enough, all my pleasantest recollections of our week in the channel centre around Dr. Dacre. Rilston Dacre. It is an uncommon name, but now, I don't know why I shouldn't write it. I have grown to find someone else much more agreeable. Clinton Meredith. What a pretty name it is. And how well suited to its owner, who was certainly the handsomest man I ever saw. I can't describe him. He has fair hair and moustache, and eyes as blue as the ocean waves around us. In thy blue eyes splendour, where the warm light loves to dwell. And then, too, he sings so charmingly, and with so much expression. It is a treat to hear when other lips from him. And then, I think, I am nearly sure, he means me to understand. 
but I will not write any more today. August 20th, another day of this delicious lotus-eating existence. Let me try to put it all down from beginning to end. I was on deck directly after breakfast, reading Lady Adelaide's Oath, with my easy chair facing the stern. The awning was over my head as usual, and the sky was of a glorious cloudless blue. The sea was very calm, and the Flora MacDonald, like everyone else, seemed to have grown idle and be loitering on her way. Lewis was lying on top of the skylight, smoking, and languidly dipping into the pages of a magazine. Mrs. Grant was seated near me, braiding herself a white peak costume, and Mrs. Mostyn, by her side, was sewing frills onto her little girl's frock. Mr. Meredith, with a book in his hand, was swinging luxuriously in his hammock, which he had caused to be slung to the spanker boom, while Dr. Dacre, a little further off, was prostrate on the deck, where he had made himself extremely comfortable with opossum rugs and cushions. The other passengers were scattered here and there, and two of the sailors, seated on the hencoops, were mending the weak places in a sail under the superintendence of the second mate whose watch it was. Suddenly, someone descries a black speck on the horizon, which must be a vessel. She comes nearer. Telescopes and opera glasses are in demand. Our little community has roused up suddenly into keen anxiety and eager life. Preparations are made for signalling her. Soon we learn that she is a steamer, the flying foam from Glasgow to Hong Kong, that she sailed a week later than the Flora and has offered us newspapers. It is needless to say that the offer is snapped at. The flying foam steams slowly past the stern of the Flora and lies to alongside of her. Our first mate goes off in a boat and fetches the precious documents. Our captain presents the skipper of the flying foam with a turtle, who sends in return an offering of a little pig. There is a great cheering and waving of hats and handkerchiefs on board both vessels, and slowly the flying foam steams away to Hong Kong, leaving the Flora MacDonald tossing on a glassy sea beneath a cloudless sky. Of course there was a rush for the newspapers. Mr. Meredith was especially anxious to see if there were any of the first sheets of the Times among them. There were two, and, pouncing upon one of them, he began to skim the column of births, marriages, and deaths. In a minute or two he stopped, turned scarlet, and flung the paper down with a low whistle. Anything interesting, Meredith, said Lewis, who had resumed his old position on the skylight. Only the death of an old uncle, he answered. I hope he has had the good taste to leave me something handsome. I looked up, struck by something forced and unnatural in the lightness of the tone. I say, Meredith, was your uncle's name Lindsay? called out his friend, Mr. Pryor, across the deck. You've hit it, old fellow, was the answer. Mr. Pryor turned away, stifling a laugh. But Clinton Meredith was perfectly grave. There was a flash of anger in his beautiful eyes for a moment when he looked at his friend. Then the colour faded from his face, and he came a few steps nearer me. Just then the luncheon bell rang, and everyone rose and gathered together their books, working materials, and other belongings. Mr. Meredith offered to carry my books below for me. I let him take them, lingered a moment behind, snatched up the times, and glanced down the list of deaths. The name of Lindsay was not among them, so that I do not believe that story about his uncle's death, but I think there was more in the above little scene than appeared on the surface, and that is why I have recorded it in my diary. After lunch it was too hot to do anything. The very absence of all wind made the vessel roll heavily, and Dr. Dacre, coming up, lashed my chair to the side of the skylight, for I was beginning to find my position untenable. Then he went away, but I remained on deck for some time. I was talking to Mr. Pryor, who was making a confidant of me in a manner which would have astonished anyone who was not aware how rapidly acquaintanceships progress at sea. Mr. Pryor is a tall man, as dark as a gypsy, and not handsome in the least, but good-tempered and gentlemanly-looking. He is engaged, he told me, to a girl whose acquaintance he made at Gibraltar about a year ago. She was travelling with her father, who had been ordered to Spain for his health, and has since recovered and chosen to offer the most decided opposition in his power to the match. This has caused Mr. Pryor to leave the army and emigrate to Otago, where he has some cousins already settled and prospering, and by whose aid he hopes to get on. But the most romantic part of the story is yet to come. Miss Wistanley, for that is her name, has promised to come out and join him in a very few months. She will be of age in January, he said, and will then act for herself. Fortunately, they have secured her brother as an ally, and he has promised to bring her out, as she would not like to undertake the voyage alone. I was very much interested in Mr. Pryor's story, and I sympathised, I am sure, to his heart's content. By the time we had talked it well over, and he had shown me two or three photographs of his lady love, a tall, fine-looking girl in a large, majestic style, the bell rang for dinner, and we had to adjourn below. Dinner at 3.30, then a gorgeous tropical sunset, and then a glorious moonlight evening on deck. I have never seen a more beautiful effect of light and shadow than you get by standing at the binnacle on such nights. The deck of the Flora MacDonald is flushed to the forecastle, which is raised a few steps. 
The second cabin passengers collect together by the mainmast and sing song after song, all of which, however ill-performed, are greeted with immense applause. A more appreciative audience for undeveloped talent it would be hard to find. Sometimes they dance instead, but tonight it was a concert and not a ball. About eight bells, the festivity was at its height. Lewis was, I fear, joining in it. At least, he was not at the stern, where I was standing with Mrs. Grant and Mr. Meredith, nor was he in the saloon. The skylights were raised, and we could look down and see that a rubber of whist was being played in the warm lamplight by Dr. Gray, the captain, Mr. Grant, and Mr. Pryor. They broke up at last, and Dr. Gray came up and joined us. I called his attention to the picturesque group collected amidships in the space of bright moonlight between the two great shadows cast by the sails. As he looked at it, he told me that the woman who has been so ill was on deck tonight. It was the first night she has been up for any length of time, and though Dr. Gray has roused our curiosity by his description of her, we have none of us had a chance to see her before. Once or twice she has appeared on deck for a few minutes while we were at dinner, but always when we came up again she was gone. Tonight I determined to see her, and I did in this manner. At nine o'clock I shook hands with Mrs. Grant and Clinton Meredith, wished them good night, and walked to the door of the companion stairs leading to the saloon. There are two doors, one opening on each side. I went in at the one on the weather side, close to which the concert was being held, and out again by the other. This part of the deck was quite quiet and deserted. Only one figure, the one I was looking for, was seated about halfway between where I stood and the forecastle. Her face was turned away, but presently she looked round and I involuntarily drew back into the shadow of the doorway. Strange to say, I recognised her. She is the woman whom I met in the street at Brighton the day before we sailed. Her face is white and wasted, and she has evidently been very ill. But Dr. Gray is right, she is very handsome, very uncommon looking. As I stood there watching her, a man came down the deck, whistling softly to himself an accompaniment to the air they were singing at the other side, for I married to a mermaid at the bottom of the sea. He emerged from the deep shadow by the mainmast out into the moonlight. It was Dr. Dacre. More curiously still, then I remembered where I had seen that name before. End of chapter 4 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 5 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher Laura Dr. Dacre, still whistling, came slowly down the deck. The ship was very steady, and he walked with deliberate ease towards the figure seated in the moonlight. Within a few paces of it he stopped, and, struck seemingly by some sudden misgiving, turned back to the door of the companion and looked keenly into the darkness. There was no one there. Lucy had gone below. By the light of the lamp of the stairs he saw that they were vacant. He listened a moment. He heard the captain's voice in the saloon wish good night to Miss Cunningham as she passed up to her cabin. Then he heard only the jingling of some glasses in the steward's pantry. Satisfied at last, he turned away. The same figure was still seated in the same place in the same attitude. She watched him quietly as he approached. When he at last stood by her side, she rose slowly to her feet and faced him. On that hot tropical night she had no covering on her head. Her beautiful black hair, glossy as satin and as smooth and waveless, was fastened in two massive plaits on the top of her head. The thin black shawl upon her shoulders she allowed to drop as she rose, showing that her dress was black also and that she wore around her throat a broad band of black velvet. Save that she had no crepe about her, she might have worn a suit of mourning. Besides that, this woman was in face and figure unusually handsome. She knew how to dress herself to advantage. She had the gift, which some women never possess or can learn, of knowing how to put on what she wore. Even in plain black this was apparent. Her costume fitted her to perfection, even to the little white ruff at her throat, which might have cost her sixpence, yet which added the only touch wanting to the general effect. Her shawl, poor and shabby as it was, was folded in a manner graceful enough to atone for its faults. Holding this shawl, caught over one arm, with the moonlight falling on her white face and throat, and the black band round it, she waited for the doctor to speak first. I am not surprised, he began. I guessed long ago it was you. Then you recognized me, she returned, looking at him steadily out of her large grey eyes. I am not changed. I have been ill, you know. I know, he said. Of course that has changed you a little. Not much, though. But never mind. You don't want compliments from me, I should imagine. Where have you been since... since I saw you last? You really wish to know? Is it possible? She returned, with the biggest irony in her tone. 
but it would be too long a story, Rilston, to tell you now and here. The time is short. Let us get what must be said spoken as quickly as possible. What do you want me to do, Laura? Not to recognize me, oh no. The time for that has gone by. But I am only a poor second-class passenger, and you are living in luxury. Considering that we once knew each other very well, considering this... She showed him, among the charms hanging to her short gold watch chain, a wedding ring in its guard, a circle of dead gold set with three turquoises. Considering this, I think you might share with me some of your comforts at least. He did not answer directly, and there was a pause in which the song from the other side of the deck came in loudly and distinctly. No grog or backy now I get, and yet for these here things my heart I do not fret. Go tell my poor old parients, t'was stern necessity, which made me wed to the mermaid at the bottom of the sea. Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. The undertone of sadness running through the grotesque lines chimed in with Dacre's mood at the moment. The complaint of the poor drowned sailor seemed to him one of the most pathetic songs he had ever heard. In the time to come, Dacre could never hear those verses without a spasm of the old pain which he was enduring when they were sung on board ship, making him wince once more. At last he turned again to his companion and said, You want money. You shall have it. Meet me here tomorrow night at the same time and I will bring it you. That will do, she answered coldly. I thank you. We will remain as we are. No one will know. And you can continue your flirtation if you like with the little wavy-haired girl I have seen you looking at so often, though I don't think she regards you with eyes of great favour after all. She wouldn't give a halfpenny for you when the handsome man with the light moustache is by. You see, I have kept my eyes open, though I have not been on deck very often. A lurch of the vessel brought her shoulder in contact with Dacre's rough pilot coat. He recoiled as if the touch hurt him with a muttered exclamation of disgust. If she heard it, she gave no sign, but stood looking away towards the man at the wheel with an air of languid indifference, which seemed to imply that she was weary of the interview and did not care how soon it terminated. Dacre had a few more words to add, however. They tell me you are going out alone, he said. Have you friends in New Zealand? One, a brother. You know it already. I had forgotten. You are going to him, then. I don't consider myself responsible for you, but I am glad there is someone out there upon whom you have some claim. Thank you. When we leave this ship, and I have got what you promised me, our paths will diverge again. You need not in the least concern yourself about me or my doings. I'll be hanged if I do after all that has passed. She was silent, still looking up the deck towards the man at the wheel. You used to have several sisters, Dacre remarked presently. What has become of them all? Augusta is with my brother Edgar in New Zealand. Nora has married a clergyman in England, and Beatrice is dead. She uttered the last words slowly, pausing between each. He saw to his amazement that her great grey eyes had grown dim and soft with tears. Beatrice, said Dacre, considering for a moment. She was your favourite sister, wasn't she? You used to talk of her sometimes, I remember, but I don't think I ever saw her. No, you never did. Was she older or younger than you, Laura? Older and far handsomer. Then she would have been thirty now. She would have been, but she is dead. This time the words were uttered in quite a different tone. The tears were gone from her handsome eyes. Sorrow was drowned, blotted out, surged over by a great wave of passion. Dacre, whose manner to her had softened very much during the last few moments, asked presently, Where did she die? At Brighton. And how long is it ago? More than a year. I owe someone a great grudge on Beatrice's account, she added presently, still with subdued anger in her voice. If it ever lies within my power, I shall demand a complete reckoning some day. A grudge? What for? That is her secret and mine. Almost as she spoke, still standing, looking up the deck, she started slightly. Then, gathering up her shawl with a hasty gesture, she turned to Dacre with the words, Tomorrow night, and do not forget, and bring it chiefly in gold. He assented, and without a word or farewell, she walked away. Dacre stood a moment looking after her, and then turned in the opposite direction. By the binnacle, he encountered Lewis Cunningham with a cigar in his mouth. There was no one else at that part of the deck except the officer of the watch. Have you been to the opera, Cunningham? Dacre asked as he passed. There has been the most astonishing display of vocal talent down there tonight, to which Lewis made only a curt reply, and seemed for some reason or other to have lost the usually even balance of his temper. Lucy's brother has never yet been more than slightly sketched in this story, but it is necessary to say these few words about him as he comes more prominently forwards. He was rather a tall man, taller by half a head than Dacre, with fair hair and dark eyebrows, not unlike his sister in the face, but far graver and more reserved in manner. Lewis was a silent man, and Lucy was full of fun and lively. Very piquant conversation was always ready on her lips. She would have made an agreeable companion from this cause alone. 
but people often remarked that it was well she had such a brother so quiet and steady, and with so much strength of character. They thought his influence might counteract some of her froth and frivolity, and teach her more real earnestness and depth of feeling. It had been the custom in the Cunningham family to speak of the two in this manner. Lucy's maiden aunts always did so, and Lucy herself, having been told of this theory from her childhood, believed in it accordingly. One thing was certain concerning Lewis Cunningham, that he was a man whose liking was not always easy to win, but once won, he was staunch and true. If he ever fell in love, it would probably be once and for a lifetime. If he ever did. But on this point, his sister was in despair. During his visit to England, she had introduced him to several of her prettiest, most agreeable friends, with matchmaking intentions most carefully concealed from Lewis himself. In vain. He remained stoically indifferent to them all. Black eyes with gleams of fire lurking in their depths, blue eyes deep and liquid, brown eyes clear and merry, all tried their power upon him and failed. He admired them all in a cool, critical fashion, but cared no more for one pair than for another. Lucy gave it up as a hopeless business. Let us go back to Lewis Cunningham on the deck of the Flora MacDonald, standing by the binnacle, smoking gloomily, and to Dacre, staring over the bulwarks on the weather side at the phosphorus on the waves. Looking round after he had been there a few minutes, he saw that Lewis had disappeared. Dacre turned away again and went on with his meditations. Just the same, he was thinking. Just the same as ever. The six years that have gone by since I saw her last have made no change. The same beauty, the same graceful manner which I, poor fool, thought so charming once. The same treacherous, savage temper. All just the same, even to the velvet band that hides the scar upon her throat. How well I remember the night the dog bit her. Not half as great a simpleton as his master, Nero knew and hated her from the very first. I can see now the large room, lit only by the firelight, the crimson curtains, the stand of hothouse flowers, and Landseer's dignity and impudence upon the wall behind her. I was thinking how superb she looked, she, the poor governess then, in her blue silk evening dress, with one yellow rose in her black hair, her handsome eyes shining and her full red lips wearing their sweetest expression to attract me. All the colouring necessary to that face lies in the hair and eyes and mouth. She was always very pale, and it suited her. I have never seen her look so ugly as when she blushed. It is a long time since she did that, I should fancy. I was not thinking anything of all this then, however. I was a great deal too far gone to criticise. I was staring at her and dreaming and making an utter ass of myself when she struck at the dog for being in her way and he sprang at her throat. That was the night that decided my fate, when I had to throttle Nero off and dress the wound and break it to her that she was marked indelibly for life. How mad I was, how awfully in earnest through it all. It seems awful to me now when I know what miserable tinsel I mistook for genuine gold. I don't believe she ever loved me. I don't believe that she ever loved anyone but herself and her sister Beatrice. And perhaps... No, I won't think about that. To meet me as she did tonight, with the coolest and most injured air, you would have thought her a long-suffering heroine, as if the fault lay entirely on my side, and this after all that she has done. Really, the brass of some women passes all conception. Ah, well, I was a great fool about Laura once. It's all over, and now I could curse the day when I took her for my wife. I must grin and bear it, and one thing is certain. I must keep out of the way of Lucy Cunningham. Fortunately for me, she can't do with my ugly face by the side of Meredith's blue eyes. It is no use thinking of what might have been. I had never a chance to try with her. Her brother looked blue tonight. What was wrong, I wonder? End of chapter 5 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 6 of Over the Hills and Far Away A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Lucy's Diary. August 20th, Thursday. Very wet all day. Impossible to get on deck, and a day spent below in the tropics is not a thing to be spoken of lightly. The seats in the saloon, the iron benches I may call them, which run along each side of the table, are not very inviting for a prolonged period. The skylights could only be partially opened as the rain beat in. I held my ground for an hour in the morning trying to knit, and to fancy it was not so very hot after all. Quite in vain. At the end of the hour I had a headache, had tried half a dozen different positions, each worse than the last, had deluded the captain into lending me a chair out of his cabin, had been upset, chair and all, by a roll of the vessel, and had been advised by Lewis, who picked me up, to go and lie by and wait for better times. I took his advice and retreated to my cabin for the rest of the day. In the evening it still rained. Scarcely anyone seemed to think it worthwhile to appear at the tea table. 
Mr. Meredith had been invisible all day. I pined for a breath of fresh air, and determined that, rain or not, I would have it, so I put on my waterproof cloak, drew the cape over my head, and crept quietly up the companion stairs. The door on the weather side was shut to keep out the rain. The other was open, and someone was standing smoking just outside. He moved away when he saw me, but, though it was growing dark, I recognized Dr. Dacre. I suppose he saw my face by the light of the lamp on the stairs as I came up, for otherwise I am sure he could not have made me out in the shadow. When I saw him turn away, I said directly, Oh, Dr. Dacre, don't go. Do stay and talk to me. I've been so stupid all day, and I want to be amused. He came back immediately, throwing away his cigar, but looking so grave that I felt in a moment as if I had been unpardonably forward. So I said, You mustn't mind what I say, Doctor, please. I always talk dreadful nonsense. Of course I could not think of your standing there in the wet to talk to me. I was quite demure and dignified now. He said, I like your nonsense, Miss Cunningham, and I'm only too happy to stay and talk to you, if, if you wish it. He rather stammered over this speech, and yet I did not feel as if he were merely inventing a polite assurance to pacify me. Dr. Dacre somehow manages to make you feel he means what he says. Therefore I answered, Well then, if you don't mind, really and truly, I do wish it. So pray stop. But, I added politely, you are in all the rain. Won't you come a little more into shelter? No, I think not. You have no idea how wet I am, Miss Cunningham. If I came any nearer, you might blame me afterwards when you find yourself laid up with a bad cold. He shook some of the drops off his white Macintosh as he spoke. Have you been out in the rain long? I asked. About half an hour. It is not pleasant, certainly, but anything is better than staying below in the tropics. I quite agree with you. I think this has been our most disagreeable day yet since we sailed. But if it is not pleasant for us, what must it be for the poor second cabin passengers? I was feeling my way to an inquiry about the handsome black-haired lady, who I am convinced Dr. Dacre knew something about. She is so out of her element among the maid-servants and farmer's daughters and young shopmen who make up the bulk of the second-class passengers that I feel convinced she has, as people say, seen better days. I have woven a romance for her in my own mind. She is certainly quite beautiful enough for the heroine of a novel. Whether Dr. Dacre divined the intention with which I made the last remark or not, I cannot say, but it is certain that he immediately turned the conversation, and thereby frustrated my diplomatic little effort to extract some information concerning her. Mr. Lennox was telling me today that his run joins on to your father's, was my companion's next observation. He thinks you will like that part of the country. I am sure I shall, and Mr. Lennox has two daughters. He has been talking to me about them. I am so glad that they will be my next neighbours. One of them is considered a beauty, the captain tells me, said Dr. Dacre. I was delighted to hear it, and immediately set her down in my own mind as destined for Lewis, but of course I did not utter this thought aloud. There was a minute's silence, and I caught myself wondering a little whether the man by my side, with his bright dark eyes looking out steadily into the night, had ever had a sister to build castles in the air for him, and in fact, what sort of a life he had led altogether, because I am persuaded that no man with as much depth of expression as I have caught in his eyes at times can have gone through the world in quite a commonplace way. Wherever he has lived, depend upon it, he has stamped his mark upon the lives around him with which his own has been brought in contact. Such men as he is exert a great influence over others for good or evil. Probably his life's drama is not over yet, for he looks a little more than thirty, and sometimes I suspect he is a trifle younger than he looks. Dr. Dacre, I said at last. Yes? I should like to ask you something. Would you? Ask me anything you please, Miss Cunningham. He looked me full in the face as he said this. I like his eyes. If you won't think me very rude, I said, I should like very much to know if you are going out to settle in the colonies, or only for pleasure. I did not come out with any intention of settling in New Zealand, he replied. I came because I am very fond of travelling, and because I had overworked myself and been ill. So I ordered myself a voyage, and here I am. This was all addressed to me, and uttered in a deliberate and straightforward manner. But afterwards he turned his head away, and said something to himself under his breath about choosing a fatal ship, which I could not understand, and which, as it was evidently not meant for me, of course I took no notice of. Then you will go back to England before long, I went on. Not immediately, perhaps. I shall see. If I find no work ready to my hand, and my conscience begins to prick me, I shall certainly return. Work, in one sense, is no necessity to me. That is, I have always had more money than I have quite known what to do with. But several years ago, Miss Cunningham, I learned to set a great value on the precept, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. And fortunately, a doctor need not look far for something to do. Wherever there is physical suffering, and where is it not, there his work is cut out for him. He paused a moment, then added in a lighter tone, You must forgive me if I am boring you. 
You asked me to stay and amuse you. I fear I've set about it in rather a clumsy fashion. This last remark I disdain to take any notice of. Did he think me a mere baby, only to be amused with playthings? I said, answering what had gone before, It appears to me that a working life like that is a very noble one, with a noble prospect before it. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Dr. Dacre shook his head rather sadly and gravely. There has been nothing noble about my life, he said. I found out that there is scarcely anything in the world which deadens mental pain, like seeing someone else suffer and being able to do a little to relieve them. It is a marvellous anodyne. So you see, selfishness has been at the root of my work after all. I think I did not honour him at all the less, but rather the more for this speech. There have been others before now who have called themselves unprofitable servants. Gradually, a great respect is growing up in my mind for Dr. Dacre. At one thing I am sure of, somewhere, and at some time in his life, this man has had a shock, a trouble, which has coloured his whole history. I became quite certain of it while he was speaking. I had an answer on my lips when a voice at the bottom of the stairs said, Miss Cunningham. I looked down. Clinton Meredith was standing below in the shadow, with his face turned up towards me. Miss Cunningham, he repeated. Yes? Are you alone? No, Dr. Dacre is here. But when I turned towards where the doctor had been standing, he was gone. He had disappeared into the rain and darkness outside. I corrected myself. He was here, but he has gone. I'm not sorry. He mounted a step or two and then stopped. Do you know, he said, I think I'm jealous of that fellow Dacre. Don't be a goose, please. Well, I am, Miss Cunningham. Here he came a step or two higher. Have I any occasion to be? To be what? Jealous. Have I any need to be? You know what I mean, and I will have an answer. He was only two steps beneath me now. Well, after all, it was a strange time and place to receive one's first proposal. The companion ladder of an emigrant ship on a dark rainy night in the tropics, with a sailor poking his head in at the door at the most critical moment to look at the clock over the stairs. We both began to laugh, but by that time we had come to an understanding so we could afford to. I said very severely, Why didn't you choose a more suitable moment, Mr. Meredith, for asking such a question? One of those lovely moonlight evenings would have been quite the correct thing, and you must needs select a night like this, and a place where I can only stand by holding on with my eyelids. And he answered, Well, I meant to have waited for a better time, but, you see, I came and found you with Dacre, and I really was jealous. No, you needn't shake your head at me, Lucy. It serves you right for calling me anything beginning with Mr. End of chapter 6 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 7 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Lucy's Diary, September 1st. Today we crossed the line. In the afternoon we were seated in a group at the stern, that is, Lewis, myself, and Clinton. Some distance from us, Dr. Dacre was sitting on one of the guns with one of the children on board, a little girl, a mere baby child, on his knee. He was showing her the works of his watch, and they were evidently upon the best possible terms with each other. Hard by, her three small brothers were carrying on a most original and extraordinary game at cricket, the doctor being umpire and seeing fair play. Two of the passengers, young women, were seated in the shade, knitting, and extremely conscious of their near neighbourhood to Dr. Dacre, at whom they cast coquettish looks from time to time, while their conversation was evidently intended for his ears. All labour lost. I do not believe he knew that they were there. I was looking down the deck and watching all this sleepily enough. Clinton imagined himself to be reading aloud to me. It was, in reality, only an excuse for sitting with Lewis and myself, for we have agreed that our engagement is not to be made public at present. Lewis has graciously accorded us his approval, but my father's consent has yet to be gained, and besides, Clinton, like most young men who emigrate, is going out to make his fortune. Until that fortune, or the germ of it, takes some definite shape, anything further than an engagement is quite out of the question. It was a very hot afternoon. There was scarcely a breath of air, and Clinton was reading an extremely foolish story in a magazine, and was even more sleepy, I believe, than myself. He went droning on, however, long after my attention had utterly deserted the book, and fixed itself in a dreamy fashion on what was taking place lower down the deck. Dr. Dacre stopped the little boy's ball with his foot, and then rose suddenly, setting the child he had on his knee gently down, and looking round hurriedly for someone to relieve him of the charge of her. The two young women, delighted at having at last caught his attention, received her from him with much graciousness, but his manner was hasty, and he had the air of a man who has just recollected a pressing engagement. 
two or three hasty strides brought him up the deck towards us, and he seated himself not far from us. An instant afterwards I noticed that Mrs. Keith had come up from the single women's cabin, and was standing not far from where he had been sitting. She was dressed as usual in plain black, with a little white lace frill at the throat. I wonder if she is in mourning, or if she knows that this style of dress sets off her good looks and suits her best of all. I do not believe that she would look half as well in colours, however carefully chosen and arranged. Perhaps, however, I am doing her injustice. It may be a lifelong mourning for someone very dear to her. As she is a widow, of course the most probable idea seems that it is for a nearer one still and a dearer one than yet all other. All I can be certain of, at any rate, is that she does not wear a widow's cap, and she does always wear a broad black velvet band round her neck. I had scarcely taken in the general details of her appearance when I saw that Mrs. Keith was approaching us. She passed Dr. Dacre and Lewis without a glance, and addressed herself to me. She asked me if I would be so good as to lend her a book, which she had seen lying on the skylight while we were at dinner, and which had my name in it. It was a cheap edition of Jane Eyre. I must apologise for trespassing on your kindness, she added, but I find the hours hang very heavily sometimes here at sea, especially when I am obliged to remain below. Words, voice, and manner were all those of a lady. I shall be very happy to lend it to you, I said. If you don't mind waiting a moment, I'll fetch Jane Eyre for you now. I'll get it, said Lewis, jumping up with what I thought unusual alacrity on his part, but suddenly, before the words were fairly out of his mouth, Dr. Dacre struck into the conversation. Don't, Miss Cunningham, he said with the strangest emphasis, and with a gesture which I am sure was involuntary, but which looked like waving Mrs. Keith back from her position by my side. Don't, Miss Cunningham. I mean, don't take the trouble. I have a copy of Jane Eyre in my cabin, and I'll get it for you directly. He had turned towards her with the last words, which were uttered with the same curious repressed vehemence. It was in his face, too, flaming out of his bright brown eyes. She bowed and thanked him without once looking at him. The colour had risen in her cheeks, but if she noticed his manner and was annoyed by it, she gave no other sign. In an instant, however, someone else had taken up the glove. I have observed for some time past that Lewis and Dr. Dacre don't seem to get on. Lewis, indeed, appears to have taken a settled dislike to that fellow Dacre. I cannot in the least penetrate to the origin of this, but on the occasion I am writing of it, it became very strongly perceptible. The next moment Lewis was glaring at Dr. Dacre as Dr. Dacre was glaring at Mrs. Keith. I don't see what business it is of yours, Dacre, Lewis said hotly. My sister is perfectly willing to lend her book. Wouldn't it be better to keep yours until you're asked? Dacre turned slowly towards him with, strange to say, an instantaneous cooling down of manner. You're quite right, Cunningham, he said with the most perfect good humour. It is no business of mine. If you are going down, of course it's all right. I wanted to save your sister a little trouble, that was all. No exception could possibly be taken to this speech, and Lewis departed on his errand, smoothed down, but still rather out of humour. When he had reappeared, and when, after a few more civil words, Mrs. Keith's tall figure had receded down the deck, Clinton for the first time joined in the conversation. Dacre, he asked suddenly, whoever is that woman? Lady, I should say, I beg her royal highness's pardon. She would have withered me with a look if she'd heard me. But, I say, I want to know, really, you know? I saw you talking to her one evening on deck, and I'm sure you can tell us if you will. Spin us a yarn about her, that's a good fellow. Dacre, with his eyes fixed on the deck at his feet, did not answer for a moment. Then he said, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Meredith, but you must go somewhere else for your yarn if you want one. You were unlucky in selecting me. Don't you know anything about her then, said Clinton? Not even who her husband was, and if he beat her. What a grind. She must have a whole novel and three volumes connected with her. I'll be hung if she is not a sort of Lady Macbeth to look at. All the perfumes of Arabia. Couldn't you fancy her saying it, Miss Cunningham? I certainly could, and I laughed a little as I acknowledged it. Lady Macbeth, said Lewis, who was not quite his own natural self again yet. What nonsense. She is far more like Maggie Tulliver in The Mill on the Floss. Too old, said Clinton, who had just been reading the book. Then followed a grand discussion concerning this mysterious lady's age. Lewis maintained it was twenty-five, and Clinton thirty. Dr. Dacre took no part in the conversation, but stood by, perfectly cool and impassive. Probably he could have settled the dispute with ease had he chosen, but he did not choose, and whatever he knows he means to keep to himself, that is evident. September 2nd. Today, Clinton and I came very near to having our first quarrel. It happened in this manner. Something brought up the subject of Madeira into our conversation, and I reminded Clinton of the cousins he had once talked of so much and so enthusiastically, who lived, he said, at Madeira. He seemed to have grown strangely reserved concerning them, and, after an ineffectual attempt to turn the conversation, said shortly, You need not be jealous, Lucy, for the one I most admired is married. Now I was not jealous, or not consciously so, and the remark, spoken gravely as it was, both hurt and offended me. I tried not to show it, but the life had gone out of our intercourse for the time, and wounded pride would not allow me to talk any more. 
I took up my book and pretended to read diligently. Clinton, for his part, not having discovered my annoyance, I really believe, sauntered away towards the stern. A few moments afterwards I saw him detach a small coral cross he had always worn on his watch chain and let it fall into the sea. That evening, when all was quite made up between us, I asked him the reason for this strange action. That cross, he said, oh, it was a present from a girl I knew once, and of course I don't care about her now, so what could I do better than throw it away? With this we close the extracts from Lucy's diary. After leaving the tropics it becomes a mere occasional record of the weather, and of the latitude and longitude, copied from the slate in the saloon, so that its interest for our readers is over. But we learn from the conclusion of it that the Flora MacDonald anchored safely at Port Chalmers on the 17th of November. End of chapter 7 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 8 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. The Lennoxes. In the veranda of a long wooden house, roofed with shingle and lying at the head of a wide valley, Lucy was standing in her riding habit about ten o'clock on a bright morning in January. The ground from the veranda sloped gradually downwards to the fence which enclosed the garden and divided it from the paddock beyond. The slope immediately beneath Lucy was covered with English grass, a rich contrast to the pale tussock grass clothing the hills on all sides of her. In front of the house the valley stretched away far and wide. Behind rose a hill, from which Maungariwa, Māori for the steep mountain, Mr. Cunningham's station took its name. It was high and rather abrupt, rocky too at the top, with huge stones which Mr. Cunningham was wont to say reminded him of Cornish boulders, partly, I suspect, because it was so long since he had left England that his memory of places, well known of old, had grown visionary. On the left the valley opened, showing a grand range of mountains stretching away towards the sea. They towered solemnly up in the summer calm. Lucy had learnt already to love these mountains, though she had not yet seen them in their full glory, alp-like under a veil of snow. Lewis was catching the horses in the paddock beyond the garden, and his sister was watching with much interest from the veranda above. Robin Hood, the handsome black horse which Mr. Cunningham had just bought for his daughter's riding, was amongst them, and was leading off the cavalcade in an undisguised defiance of Lewis's attempts to approach them. But assistance was at hand. Two riders were descending the hill behind the house, and Lucy, catching sight of them, advanced joyfully to meet them at the gate. One, a man about fifty, sunburnt and bearded, was greeted as Papa. The other, a remarkably handsome, fair-haired young fellow, received a silent shake of the hand, but appeared satisfied with his reception notwithstanding. I was coming over from Pryor's place, he said, and I met Mr. Cunningham on the way. Are you going anywhere, Lucy? Lewis and I are going to ride over and spend the day with the Lennoxes. Won't you come too? Do come. Of course he will, said Mr. Cunningham. She doesn't coax badly, does she, Meredith? It's about eight miles over the hills. Lewis knows the way, and I suppose you'll all be back tonight? He slipped his horse's bridle over the gatepost and sauntered away towards the house, leaving the other two standing together, Meredith still holding his horse. It was rather too public a place for making love, however. Clinton glanced around and saw that Mr. Cunningham was standing in the veranda, that the Scotch cook was looking out the kitchen window, and that Lewis, in the paddock below, had his attention visibly turned towards them. So he only contrived, swiftly and dexterously, to touch his lips to Lucy's gauntlet, under cover of his horse's neck, and asked her what she thought she deserved for running away as soon as he arrived. Don't flatter yourself, you'll escape me, though. Of course I'm going too, and I shall have my revenge, but not now. Lucy laughed and flushed over her retort. You ought to be very much obliged to me. I'm going to introduce you to two young ladies, and one of them is the belle of the district. There, you ungrateful boy. The ungrateful boy said he was at her service, and she might do what she pleased with him. But about the young ladies he did not care. His heart was steeled to all but one. Ah, but you're going to like them, I know, said Lucy. I've only seen them once when they came here to call on me, but I quite fell in love with them, particularly with Effie, though she isn't as pretty as Jeanie. Then she added with a sly hesitation in her tone, Clinton, are you quite sure you won't like them better than me? Clinton rejected the notion with disdain, and his answer was eminently satisfactory. By this time, Lewis, out of all patience, was making erratic signals to them from below, so they went down the hill together into the paddock, and Robin Hood, having been captured by the two men, was made over to Lucy's guardianship. Thenceforward, there was no further trouble with him. In fact, his behaviour to his mistress was always marked by a sense of chivalry, greatly to his credit. Considering himself put upon his honour, he followed her like a lamb to the house, and affably stooped his head to assist her in that novel feat she had undertaken of bridling him. 
In a quarter of an hour, the three riders were well on their way to Deep Dean, Mr. Lennox's station. Their course lay over the hills, just then of tissue paleness, relieved here and there by a few small cabbage trees or a little flax. There was no brush in that neighbourhood, nor had any cultivation as yet relieved the wildness and desolation of the scenery. Riding through one gully, Lewis pointed to where a sheep path struck sharply off to the left. That is the way to the outstation, Lucy, he said, where my life for the present will chiefly have to be passed. She looked up the wild ravine in the direction he indicated, wishing she could see through the hills which barred her view of Lewis's future home. But she never dreamt for a moment of the important part which that cluster of wooden huts, ten good miles away, was to play in her life's story. They cantered on, and then they saw some cattle at a distance, and Lewis, with his opera glass, descried, or thought he descried, one or two of his own among them. He rode a little way towards them to make sure, and left Lucy and Clinton halted near an oasis of flax plants. They bent down the tall co and sucked the honey from the flowers, agreeing that they were equal to the most superior French bonbons, and streaking their lips and noses with the golden dust. It was a beautiful summer morning. Everything new and colonial was enchanting to the two, just fresh from England. This ride, and a few others, lingered in the brightest tints on Lucy's memory, until there rose up in her heart a great wave of pain, and washed all the colours out of them forever. They descended at last onto the plains, the great yellow level stretching for miles between the hills and the sea. They rode on, always skirting the hills, for what was really a considerable distance, but on the plains they could go faster, and Robin Hood's great strides left the ground behind him so rapidly, at such an easy regular pace, that Lucy's idea of space became confused, and she could not have made any correct guess at the number of miles they had traversed. When Deep Dean came in sight, nestled snugly among gum trees at the outlet of a gully between the hills. Of course they were very welcome. One of the prettiest little golden-haired Scotch lassies imaginable opened a long bow window of the drawing room, and came dancing down the lawn to meet them. It was Jeanie Lennox, and behind her came her sister Effie. They were called after the heroines of Mr. Lennox's favourite novel, The Heart of Midlothian, and, as a matter of course, their names did not fit them in the least. Effie was the older of the two, and had grown up the plainest, with by far the most strength of character and intellect. Lucy was not long in discovering this, but still she loved Jeanie. Who could help it? She was the smallest, prettiest, most loving girl in her manners Lucy had ever met with, altogether a fascinating little piece of childishness. Effie was taller, larger, graver, less gold in her hair, less violet in her eyes. She walked quietly to meet them, with a step which did not dance. They were both delighted to see Lucy, carried her off to their room, and offered her everything they could think of to assist her in her toilet. She must take off her riding habit, of course, and she must wear instead a polonaise of Effie's and a skirt of Jeanie's by way of being strictly impartial. Finally, they insisted that she must not dream of returning home that night. It was an understood thing in the colonies, Jeanie assured her, with her lovely blue eyes all earnestness, that people always stayed the night. She was so urgent in her entreaties, and Effie too so determined, that Lucy agreed at once to stop. It becomes necessary here to explain that, though Mr. Cunningham had laid no obstacle in the way of his daughter's engagement to Clinton Meredith, who came of a good family, and had expectations from two old uncles at home, he had stipulated that it was not to be made known to the world in general at present. They were too young, he considered, and Meredith had not as yet invested his capital, or decided where to purchase land. Probably, Mr. Cunningham had reflected that, if some wealthy squatter were to take a fancy to lay his heart and his wool bales at Lucy's feet, it would be a pity for a boy and girl kind of affair such as this to stand in her light. Therefore the Lennoxes knew nothing of any link so far between Lucy and Meredith, and Jeanie, at all events, was never likely to find it out for herself. They dined, and strolled up the beautiful gully behind the house in the cool of the evening. Mindful of some vague ideas which had crossed her mind during the voyage, Lucy had her attention roused to note her brother's manner to these two girls, whom he had met today for the first time. She soon discovered that Jeanie and Lewis were utterly unattractive to one another. Not bad looking, but not my style at all, he said of her afterwards, and Jeanie told her sister in confidence that she loved Lucy Cunningham, but thought her brother was not much good in any way. Jeanie's eyes were certainly prejudiced. Lewis was a fine-looking, rather attractive young fellow, tall and fair, with dark eyes and a silky yellow beard, never degenerating into the slightest tinge of red. He was not as decidedly and undeniably handsome as Meredith, perhaps, but, to atone for this, he possessed a larger share of that subtle, indefinable essence of manliness which will always, in the long run, prove more irresistible to a woman's heart than any mere attraction springing from good looks alone. Then, too, Lewis was a man of a very resolute, very independent disposition. Had he chosen, he would have set his opinion against the world's, and stood by it without flinching. Characters of this type are apt to be stubborn at times to an excess, and Lewis was by no means an exception to the rule. 
nevertheless the obstinacy of his temperament was a part also of its strength and in many feminine minds would have roused only a greater longing to subdue a fortress apparently so impregnable lucy walking by his side that night felt a shade of disappointment at the discovery that genie lennox and her brother were never even likely to appreciate each other's society perhaps however effie might be his fate instead thought the young matchmaker by his side that would be better still for of the two sisters lucy was the most attracted by effie no lewis courteously attentive was cool and unimpressed as ever in this direction also i do believe he'll never marry thought his sister with a spice of indignation at the failure of all her castles in the air mingled with her disappointment she felt a little comforted however when she noticed that effie's interest seemed slightly roused by the brother of her new friend and that she was not inclined to be so utterly indifferent to lewis's merits as her sister jeanie lucy had fallen behind with these two as they walked up the gully so with all her quickness and clearness of intuition something else happened which she did not see jeanie had mounted on to the top of a huge stone and was balancing herself on its sharp summit with the most perfect grace utterly regardless of clinton's entreaties to her to come down before she fell as her especial cavalier he considered himself responsible for her welfare nonsense she said i've often done it before i shan't fall i know she looked lovely as she spoke in her frilled pink and white muslin dress a great dolly varden hat swinging in one hand and her high piled rolls of golden hair glossy satin smooth hair without wave or flaw in its perfectly arranged order you little beauty clinton said to himself under his breath i'd no idea the colonies contained anything half so perfect jeanie spite of her confident assertion overbalanced herself and nearly fell she turned quite white in one moment and looked at meredith with the most piteous expression in her blue eyes how am i to get down she said transformed in an instant into a veritable little coward he held out his hands jump he said and i'll take care you don't fall she placed her hands in his and sprang down as lightly as possible he detained her a moment and said audaciously now may i claim a reward there was no anger in the soft eyes he looked down at but she laughed a little and blushed clinton saw he was sure of his ground glanced round to ascertain that the others were not in sight then bent his head and swiftly and stealthily touched one of the little hands with his lips he had once before that day gone through the same little drama when he met lucy in the morning it was dreadfully cool of him really jeanie said to herself afterwards but he is very handsome indeed and on the whole i think i won't tell effie it was effie whom she wished more especially to remain in ignorance concerning the little flirtation just described not her mother mrs lennox who was now seated at her sewing machine in the drawing-room at deepdean was just another genie a matronly genie and much plainer with only the germ of the beauty in fact which had developed so remarkably in her little daughter but with no clearer head or stronger spirit they both looked up to effie went to her for advice when in any difficulty and left her to do the thinking for all three adopting her opinions ready-made even mr lennox scarcely exercised as much influence in the household as his elder daughter the two genies looked up to him too much effie's girlishness and inexperience made her nearer and more easily clung to than the grave elderly head of the house the next morning the two girls escorted lucy to the gate of the paddock and after much kissing and embracing on genie's part she rode off with lewis and clinton when they had gone a short distance lucy looked back effie still faithful was looking after them genie had already turned away involuntarily lucy spoke genie is a dear little thing she said but i love effie best what do you think of them clinton he answered with the most languid indifference of tone and manner i don't think i quite agree with you lucy i don't take much to miss lennox the other is a pretty little thing but those regular faces with no change of expression are horridly insipid did he think so last night beneath the blue gums in the gully of deep dean one foot on shore and one on sea to one thing constant never but you will find it safer in the end clinton meredith to be off with the old love before you are on with the new end of chapter eight Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 9 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher A Drawn Game Lucy's father was a man of passionate disposition. His temper, once roused, was mighty. His capacity for anger was gigantic yet in spite of this he could scarcely be called an irritable man sometimes for months all would go on smoothly with him and then there would come a day when the times were out of joint some member of his family would cross his will while the flames were yet smouldering and lo an explosion which nearly shook the roof over their heads 
Lucy remembered with horror one or two scenes between her father and Lewis in the early days, before either of them had emigrated to New Zealand and when she was quite a child. Fortunately, Lewis's disposition was not a hasty one. Compared with his father, he might be said to hold his temper in his hand, almost completely under his own control, so that of late years, since Lewis had grown to man's estate, quarrels between the father and son had become of rarer and rarer occurrence. But there was one of no ordinary character destined to rise up between them at this period. Two days after their visit to the Lennoxes, Lucy was with her father and brother in the drawing room at Maungarewa after their six o'clock dinner. The day had been one of the hottest in the whole month, intense heat and a nor'wester to crown it. Regular Melbourne weather, said Mr Cunningham, with a sigh of relief at the coolness which had followed upon a sudden change of wind, and which was settling down over the land with the approaching night. He was lying on the chintz-covered sofa near the large bay window of the drawing room, looking tired out. Lewis and he had been out after cattle in the heat, and they had had a great deal of trouble with them, and Mr. Cunningham had shattered the handle of his favourite stock whip into a dozen pieces, which was not exactly a soothing termination to their ride. Lucy had just come in from the garden, and was seated near him, with her lap full of roses, geraniums, and carnations. She was arranging them in a large blue and white china bowl, which stood always on a little table of light wood by the window, and as she did so she was talking to her father about the garden at Deepdean. From this subject she glided naturally into speaking about Effie Lennox, who had greatly taken her fancy. Lewis was reading the newspaper and did not appear to be attending, but Mr. Cunningham was roused up gradually out of his fatigue. He sat up suddenly on the sofa in the gathering dusk, and commenced to stroke his thick, light brown beard with one hand, a gesture which, in Mr. Cunningham, always denoted great interest in the subject uppermost in his mind at the time. Both the Miss Lennoxes are uncommonly nice girls, he remarked to Lucy, quite above the ordinary run, and Lennox is as well off, I believe, as any man I know. Then turning to his son, he added, Lewis, put down that paper. I wish to speak to you. Lewis put it down. Mr. Cunningham hesitated for a moment, then asked, somewhat abruptly, How old are you now, my boy? Lewis's ideas on this subject appeared hazy. At last, prompted by his sister, he replied, Twenty-eight last August. Then it's high time you were married, returned his father with startling emphasis and decision. And the sooner you go in for that, and settle down, the better and the more pleased I shall be. You could not do better than take one of Tom Lennox's daughters. In fact, I've had my eye upon one of them for some time for you, and I desire you'll set about it without delay. The last sentence was uttered in a tone of command truly imperial, and which would have itself been enough to rouse the opposition of many sons, but Lewis was accustomed to his father's manner. Still, in the pause that followed, Lucy's heart began to beat. She felt for the first time that the atmosphere was stormy. "'Which of them did you wish me to have?' inquired Lewis at last, with ominous calmness. Lucy detected amusement in his tone. She trembled lest her father should do so also. Ridicule of any kind was to Mr. Cunningham like the red flag of a bull, and it made him furious in a moment. "'You may take which you like. I don't care,' returned Mr. Cunningham, quite unsuspiciously, however. "'Please yourself. I'll have the outstation made into a thoroughly comfortable home for you, and you may be sure neither of Tom Lennox's daughters would come to you empty-handed. His heart is set upon them.' "'You are very kind, really,' said Lewis, quite grave this time. But to tell you the truth, it's my belief neither of the two ladies in question would have me if I asked them. Lucy, who had been aghast at the remarkably free and easy manner in which her father was disposing of Miss Lennox's hands and fortunes, was glad Lewis at least had the good sense to remember that they might themselves have a vote in the matter. But Mr. Cunningham rejected the idea with disdain. Of course they'll have you, he said. Either of them. There can't be any doubt as to that. I know for a fact that they are not engaged, and what more would you have? A woman who isn't engaged will always snap at the first offer made her, provided the fellow doesn't squint or have red hair, and sometimes even then. It mayn't be so in books, but it is so in real life. Oh, Papa, cried Lucy, utterly scandalized at last, but he took no notice of her. In fact, he had forgotten her presence, and stroked his beard with increasing excitement. Well, if you won't accept that excuse as a valid one, said Lewis slowly, I'm afraid I must put it the other way. I don't think I could myself do with either of them. Jeanie is not my taste, and her sister. He stopped abruptly. Mr. Cunningham had sprung to his feet. This time he saw, or thought he saw, that his son was laughing at him. Don't let me have any more such atrocious nonsense, he said, even more imperiously than he had spoken yet. I tell you to take your choice of the two nicest girls in the province, and offer to provide handsomely for you, and you tell me they are not to your taste? Now, will you go over to Deepdean tomorrow and make Jeanie Lennox an offer? or will you not? 
I don't admire her indeed, said Lewis, still good-temperedly, and with another effort to deprecate his father's anger. I never care about those blonde beauties. I can't think of it, really. Did you ever admire any woman in your life, I wonder, inquired Mr. Cunningham, ironically. Blonde beauties, indeed. But I tell you what, sir, if you ever dare to marry a woman with dark hair, neither she nor you shall ever cross my threshold. He was making himself ridiculous in his wrath, as hot-tempered people are very apt to be, if they only knew it. Surely half the disputes in the world would evaporate instantaneously if we could only see ourselves as others see us. Lewis had risen and was leaning against the mantelpiece with his face turned away. When he looked round, it had hardened and stiffened into an expression Lucy had seen there before and recognised. It meant dogged resistance and an obstinacy which would not yield one inch of ground. Lucy rose up to go. She was growing afraid to stay now that she saw that look upon her brother's face. Once more Mr. Cunningham said slowly, Will you go over next week and make Jeanie Lennox an offer or not? And Lewis returned a simple negative, coolly and emphatically spoken. At this Lucy fled, hardly closing the door behind her in time to shut out from the first burst of the storm that followed. She darted into her own room and seated herself upon her little iron bed, listening with a beating heart to the faint mutterings of the thunder which reached her once or twice even there, hasty steps, and now and then an unusually loud tone of voice. The daylight gradually faded away, and then the moon rose. The corner of the veranda outside Lucy's window was full of soft dusk gloom, just crossed by a narrow strip of moonlight. She sat staring out into the shadow, until at last it seemed to move and flicker gently, and gradually it assumed to her mind the form of Mrs. Keith in her black trailing garments, as she used to stand again and again, leaning over the bulwarks of the Flora MacDonald, looking out to sea. It seemed strange, Lucy thought, to be reminded of her in this weird, unearthly fashion, considering that she had never seen or even thought of Mrs. Keith since the Flora anchored at Port Chalmers. What might have become of her, Lucy had never once troubled her head to imagine. It was past nine o'clock when Lewis came out of the drawing room, closing the door behind him. He went into the veranda and Lucy ran to him. She was not in the least afraid of her brother. Lewis was, in his way, very fond of her. He stroked her hair and told her not to mind. He was going to catch his horse and ride to the outstation there and then. It was a bright, cloudless night, and all this will have blown over in a few days, he added. Are you going to ask Jeanie? she ventured to whisper. He shook his head. But it has been a hard battle, he went on after a moment, and I've only just held my ground. I'm to be cut off with a shilling if I ever marry anyone with dark hair, or indeed, for that matter, anyone except Jeanie or Effie Lennox. Neither Lewis nor his sister could help laughing. The threat put into words sounded so ludicrous and unreasonable, but yet Lucy knew her father well enough to be aware that, in spite of his absurdity, he was quite as likely as not to adhere to the very letter of his vow. The obstinacy of Lewis's disposition was certainly inherited from Mr. Cunningham. Lewis stood some minutes longer in the veranda, seemingly lost in thought, the smile still lingering round his lips, and in his expression, which struck Lucy as odd and not altogether agreeable, it was a smile more of contempt than of amusement. Then suddenly he seemed to wake up with a slight start, wished her good night, and desired her to go back into the house at once. The air was growing chill, and she had on still the light muslin dress she had worn during the heat of the day. She returned to her room. A few minutes afterwards, Lewis's heavy step crunched the gravel on the walk in front of her window as he passed round the corner of the house on his way to fetch his horse. She lifted a corner of the curtain and looked out. The moon had risen higher and shone brightly in her eyes, and the shadow which had startled her in the early part of the evening had quite disappeared. End of chapter 9 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 10 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Mrs. Pryor's Brother. Life at Maungarewa glided on for some time very peacefully after this stormy interlude. Mr. Cunningham's anger blew over in a few days, as Lewis had prophesied that it would, assisted probably by his son's departure to Auckland for a month to settle some business matters not concerning the course of this story. After his return, Lewis lived principally at the station which was situated like an outpost on the verge of his father's land, so that opportunities for a renewal of the argument, had Mr. Cunningham wished it, were few and far between. Lucy had by this time quite settled down into her new life, and England was becoming the dream, not New Zealand. Only the coming and going of the English mail reminded her at times that there were still friends and still another country across the blue ocean, of which the faint thunder of the surf could be heard on a still day, 
in the peaceful valley where Mangariwa lay. The visitors who found their way to Mangariwa were, except the Lennoxes, almost entirely of the masculine order. It is true that there were a few ladies scattered about among the different farms and stations, and rather more collected at the nearest township ten miles or so away, but they were almost all married, and for the most part too much occupied with the care of children and domestic matters to have time to spend in paying visits, especially country ones, so that Lucy soon found her visiting list numbered three or four masculine to one feminine name, and the constant repetition of strange bearded faces became in time rather monotonous. Gentlemen were kind enough to drop in pretty frequently at Maungarewa, and sometimes to remain for two or three days. It was a comfortable and well-ordered household, rather inviting after many of the rough bachelor establishments of the district, Lucy's relations having, with unusual forethought, included the elements of housekeeping in her education to a more thorough extent than is usual, I believe, among the young ladies of the present day. But none of her home friends ever found her sketches of New Zealand scenery and watercolours less charmingly touched because she could personally superintend the preparation of beefsteak pies, which were not uninviting when completed, or caused to be placed upon her table a roast turkey, with delicate accompaniments of mashed potatoes and sauces, which her father, at all events, appreciated. Nor was her admiration of Tennyson or Mrs. Browning ever deadened by the fact that her apricot tarts melted in the mouths of all those who partook of them. Clinton Meredith and many others were, at all events at this period, the gainers by the different branches of domestic economy which Lucy had been brought up to cultivate. She received many compliments, which gave her pleasure, more or less, for surely there was never a clever housekeeper yet who did not like to feel that she was appreciated. But her head was not over-exalted by the praise bestowed upon her, and one day she nearly made Clinton jealous by telling him that she had met no one since she came out whom she considered half as agreeable as Dr. Dacre. I wonder where he is and what he is doing, Lucy added, more to herself than to him. It seems odd that we have never heard of him since we landed, but perhaps he has already gone home. Clinton had heard of him, and knew that he was at that time not very far from Mongarewa, but, being jealous, he did not choose to tell her so, and so the subject dropped. But somewhere about this time Lucy heard that Mr. Pryor, another old shipmate, was at last to be made happy. His lady love landed in perfect safety at Christchurch with her brother, under whose protection she had consented to venture upon the long voyage. Miss Wistonley became Mrs. Pryor within a week of her setting her foot once more upon terra firma, and, after a short honeymoon, the happy couple came up to settle upon the station of which Mr. Pryor was manager, about six miles from Maungarewa. They brought the brother with them, and Arthur Wistanley accompanied them when they went to Maungarewa to return Lucy's call. Mrs. Pryor, in spite of her majestic figure and the atmosphere of strong-mindedness which appeared to surround her, was no rider, so her husband drove her over, and Arthur Wistanley rode his brother-in-law's grey horse. They found Lucy and her father both at home. It was Lucy's first introduction to the bride, as she had happened to be out on the day of Lucy's visit. Mrs. Pryor was very like her photographs, a handsome girl with a Roman nose, and on a large scale altogether, but she was commonplace-looking after all, which was just the thing that her brother was not. Both of them had dark hair and eyes, and there all resemblance between them began and ended. He was as utterly unlike his sister as could well be imagined. Arthur Wistanley was a man of about the medium height and size, but, instead of Mrs. Pryor's aquiline nose and wide mouth, he had delicate, regular features, which would have made the fortune of a girl's face. He would have been a handsome man, but for his eyes. They were so light in colour and so expressionless that they marred the effect of an otherwise attractive countenance. The most striking thing about him, however, was the utter want of interest or animation in everything he did or said. He looked like a man half asleep, without energy enough to rouse himself, and he never once brightened up the whole time he remained at Maungarewa. The same weary indifference characterised his manner as his face. It was not a sad face at all, but more like that of a person who has received some shock, under the influence of which the spirit remained stunned, and without sympathy in what took place around it. When I said that Mrs. Pryor brought her brother with her, I used the words advisedly. He was evidently entirely at her disposal, and too lazy or too tired out to have any will at all of his own. Lucy found afterwards that the impression he had made upon her was of a person suffering from a violent and prolonged fit of sulkiness. Mr. Cunningham and Mr. Pryor plunged into an animated discussion of colonial politics, in which the governor's name repeatedly came uppermost. Lucy and Mrs. Pryor compared notes as to their respective voyages, while Mr. Wistanley sat quietly back in an easy chair, listening to the conversation of the two ladies, but without making the slightest effort to join in it himself. Only when they were going away and Lucy patted the neck of the grey horse, he asked her if she was fond of riding. 
When she had replied in the affirmative, and, by way of politely prolonging the conversation for a moment or two, had inquired whether he shared the same taste, he said in his sleepy way, I did once, but I had a little too much of it when I was at home at one time. Mrs. Pryor turned sharply round, just as she finished shaking hands with Mr. Cunningham. Why will you speak of that time, Arthur? she said with asperity. You know it is nothing to your credit. Arthur took the rebuke very calmly, and did not seem to care about it in the least, but he said no more. Lucy gathered, however, from the frown upon Mrs. Pryor's face, that he might at one time have been the black sheep of his family, if so quiet a young gentleman could ever have found energy enough within him to be anything decided at all. It appeared in course of time that she was partly right in her conjecture, for afterwards, as she learned to know more of Mrs. Pryor, little scraps of that lady's family history from time to time slipped out. Arthur has given us all such trouble, his sister said in her superb, majestic way. I assure you, Papa says he would rather have had ten daughters than such a son. Fancy, we sent him to read with a clergyman in Devonshire, and he ran away. We heard nothing of him for a long time, and we could not trace him. But at last he wrote to Papa, and then, only imagine, we found he had enlisted in a cavalry regiment. She paused here and waited for some show of horror and amazement on Lucy's part, which Lucy, as in duty bound, proceeded to give. Papa bought him out, Mrs. Pryor then continued, and went to him, and there he was in miserable little lodgings, sitting with his face hidden in his hands, and the table all covered with bits of letters, torn up. When Papa spoke to him, he started as if he had been shot, and then suddenly fainted away. He had a bad illness, brain fever, I believe, but got over it, and has never given us any trouble since. Lucy said she was glad to hear it, and wondered privately whether it was at that time that Mr. Arthur Wistonley had lost his interest in sublunary affairs, and ceased to care enough about anything to have a will of his own left. She grew to like him very well as time went by, and she saw more of him, and for his part, he appeared to take quite a fancy to her. He always singled her out whenever they met, and showed a greater respect for her opinion than for that of anyone else. In fact, he paid her a good deal of attention in a quiet way. Mrs. Pryor observed this with delight, hoping that Arthur might really make up his mind to marry, and settle down near her at last. She felt perfectly satisfied with his choice, for she too had acquired a genuine liking for Lucy. She was strongly confirmed in her idea by an accidental discovery which she made about this time. Arthur Wistanley had one curious habit. When he was thinking or listening to music, or to a conversation taking place near him, he had an odd, absent fashion of scrawling over every scrap of paper he could lay hold of the letter L. He would form it into a monogram in every variety of character and design, sometimes really graceful ones. Occasionally, but not often, he joined it with the initial of his own name, A, but he always crossed these out with heavy pencil strokes afterwards. Mrs. Pryor found one morning a half-sheet of notepaper thus ornamented, and, remembering that Miss Cunningham's Christian name began with an L, she regarded it as positive proof of the manner in which that young lady occupied her brother's thoughts. By way of ascertaining how far the admiration was mutual, she, with much concealed artfulness and great outward innocence of manner, showed her discovery to Lucy the next time they were alone together. Arthur is so absurdly absent, she said, but I suppose we must excuse him. Only imagine... He was amusing himself by scribbling these monograms all the time that I was talking to him about getting the new carpets we want for this house in Dunedin. So stupid of him, I don't believe he heard a word that I said. She placed the half-sheet of notepaper she held in Lucy's fingers, and watched with secret anxiety for the expression of her face as she looked it over. It seems to be all designs of one letter, Lucy remarked calmly. These are very pretty, and would look well embroidered on the corner of a handkerchief. Where have I seen an L like this before, I wonder? Oh, I know, it was on the back of a watch. She did not blush or look in the least conscious of any possible connection between Mr. Wistanley's fits of absence and herself, and Mrs. Pryor, to use her own words, could not flatter herself that Miss Cunningham so far evinced any reciprocity. End of chapter 10 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 11 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher Effie Time passed. January and February burnt themselves out in heat and glare and dust, and March came in with cooler days, but equally lovely. One day Lucy had ridden over to Deep Dean alone. She knew her way over the hills now perfectly, and the three girls went backwards and forwards between each other's homes almost regularly. Lewis never came to Maungarewa when he thought that Effie or Jeanie Lennox would be there, but once or twice he had been caught and could not avoid a meeting. In such cases he devoted himself to Effie, and Jeanie tossed her golden head privately and thought him the greatest bear she had ever known. 
The little blonde beauty was used to admiration and enjoyed it heartily. Effie always took Lewis's part when her sister attacked him, but otherwise never spoke about him at all. Only Lucy thought it a suspicious fact that just about this time Effie refused an excellent offer from a distant cousin of her own, who had been attached to her ever since they had played together as children, and whom her father and mother had always hoped she would marry. It's odd, said Jeanie thoughtfully when her sister was not in the room. Effie seemed to like poor Jack till quite lately, and then suddenly she grew as cold to him as ice. It was odd, Lucy thought, but to Effie herself she did not venture to say a word. Only she found herself constantly hoping that Lewis, after all, would change his mind and gratify both his father and herself by choosing the wife they both so eagerly desired for him. On this March evening, when Lucy had ridden over to Deepdean, the three girls were sitting by one of the long open windows of the drawing room. They formed a pretty group. Lucy was seated in the middle, wearing her dark grey riding habit, set off by its little white collar and scarlet tie at the throat. It was a costume which suited her figure, and the sober-coloured cloth of the habit seemed to make her great coils of glittering waving hair a richer coronet than ever to her small, well-shaped head. Jeanie was sitting on a footstool at her feet, in a delicate blue-spotted muslin which just suited her delicate pink-tinted cheeks. A scarlet carnation was coquettishly fastened over her left ear, and another in the belt that surrounded her neat little waist. Effie was the farthest back of all, and was dressed like her sister but without the flowers. Her eyes, less lovely in colour than Jeanie's, but with far greater capacity of expression, were fixed on the sunset sky without, and she held one of Lucy's hands in hers. The soft air came in at the window and fanned their faces, and once wafted in a shower of rose leaves from the full-blown flowers which twined round the sill. Effie caught some of the leaves in her hand, and played with them unconsciously while she was speaking. Ah, there was one rose there which was to fade gently before its bloom had fully come. Jeanie looked up with large blue eyes when the conversation of the others, as sometimes happened, got beyond her depth, but she admired all that they said, whether she understood it or not, and was happy and loving as usual. At last they saw a horseman ride through their paddock and up to the garden gate. "'It is Mr. Meredith,' said Jeanie and Lucy in a breath. Lucy thought that he had found out where she was gone and had come to fetch her home. Jeanie believed that he had come to see her pretty little self. It was not the first time by any means that he had done so. She had no more idea of any engagement between Clinton and Lucy than she had of the geology of the district. Even Effie had not found it out. Jeanie jumped up in a moment, saying, I'll go and find Papa, and she ran out of the room. She came back in a few moments with her hat in her hand, and reported that Papa had gone up the gully, and that she was going to find him. Somehow Papa was very apt to be up the gully whenever Mr. Meredith came to Deepdean, but fortunately Effie did not think of remarking upon this fact to her companion. Presently they saw Jeanie guiding Clinton across the lawn to the little gate which opened onto the path leading up the gully among the trees. He doesn't know I am here, thought Lucy, but I wonder Jeanie has not told him, she added to herself a moment afterwards. Somehow or other she felt suddenly sobered, and she looked out at the fading light in the sky with a feeling of sadness at her heart for which she could scarcely account. In a few minutes Mrs. Lennox came into the room. Where is Jeanie? she asked. She has gone with Mr. Meredith up the gully to find Papa, said Effie. But Papa is not up the gully, returned her mother. He has gone over to the manager's house to speak to Mr. Hood. I could have told Jeanie that if she had asked me. Lucy felt more sober than ever as Mrs. Lennox spoke, but her faith in Clinton was too great not to resist the first slight shock it had received. I suppose they will soon be back, went on Mrs. Lennox, when they find that Papa is not there, and she went out of the room again. Almost at the same moment, Effie shook down all the rose leaves from her lap onto the floor. There, she said, I'm tired of them. They are withered. Let me throw them away. Their day is over, poor things, said Lucy, with an involuntary sigh. There will be more next summer, Effie returned, looking up with a smile. Ah, yes, said Lucy, but not the same. She scarcely knew what prompted her to this little bit of sorrowful moralising, but afterwards she remembered those words with tears, for they were only too true. It's well Lewis doesn't hear us, she went on in a moment, quite in her usual manner. He would call us dreadfully sentimental. Effie stooped to collect together the scattered rose leaves on the ground. Still bending down, she said, Mr. Lewis has not been here for a long time. I suppose he is very busy. Very busy indeed just now, returned his sister, thinking she could guess what was passing in Effie's mind. He has just had to buy a new horse. One of his others was quite lame from being ridden too much. The other one is a beauty, dark bay, and called Llewellyn. Wise as Lucy thought herself, she was not quite as much behind the scenes as she imagined. One day she learnt this, but that day was far in the future yet. There was a slight pause. Effie did not seem to take much interest in the bay horse. At last she said, suddenly and rather shyly, I wonder if anyone ever marries their first love. 
Papa told us one day that he did not, and he did not believe people ever did, except in books. Lucy felt that she could quite understand this. It would indeed have been difficult to picture plain, commonplace Mrs. Lennox as anyone's first love. In her girlish arrogance, which was really ignorance of life, she did not allow for the changes brought to Mrs. Lennox by the slow, sure discipline of years. Some people do not seem to have any first loves at all, she said, in answer to Effie's remark. My brother Lewis, for instance. She intended Effie to understand that at all events she had no rival to fear. The field was clear before her, and who knew what might not come to pass in time. But she was a little startled at Effie's reply. I do not think that follows at all, Effie said. About Mr. Lewis, I mean. Men are just as careful sometimes not to let anyone find out their secrets as we girls are, and you know, when they travel about much, they make many acquaintances we do not know of at all. That is quite true, said Lucy, but still I am sure I am right about Lewis. Remembering this conversation in after days with a wider experience of life, the confidence with which she had spoken seemed to her unutterably ridiculous. Effie, from whatever reason it sprang, had proved in this instance a keener judge of Lewis Cunningham's character than his sister Lucy. The two girls remained seated by the window, talking together for a long time. Both felt during that hour that the bond of their friendship was signed and sealed for their lifetimes. Would it have been so, and would it have lasted? I think it would, but it was never put to the test. The wear and tear of life never touched it, and time had no power to try it, because one of these two was soon to pass forever out of the region where time holds sway. A little longer, and there was to be no thought of marrying or giving in marriage for Effie Lennox. End of chapter 11. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Chapter 12 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Under the Blue Gums. Clinton and Jeanie were away a long time. It was a lovely evening, very cool and pleasant under the gum trees and Australian shrubs, which had been planted with excellent effect on both sides of the gully, and neither of them were in any hurry to return to the house. Clinton, to do him justice, had no idea that Lucy was then at Deepdean. He had not seen her since the week before, when he had spent two days at Maungarewa, and enjoyed himself supremely. It was business which had brought him that night to Deepdean, and he really wished to see Mr. Lennox before he went away but still there was plenty of time, and Jeanie was a very pleasant companion, especially in that soft romantic gloom beneath the boughs of the trees, with the little creek which flowed like an English stream through the gully, gliding gently by at their feet. They came at last to the large stone, or rather rock, which was the scene of Jeanie's exploit alluded to in a former chapter. The grass was soft and green at its foot, and Jeanie sat down and took off her hat. I'm tired, she said, and I don't see anything of papa. Clinton, who had never expected to meet Mr. Lennox there at all, sat down by her side, and, pulling a few leaves from one of the trees, crushed them in his fingers, filling the air with their aromatic perfume. I shall always love this place, he then remarked sentimentally, favouring Jeanie with one of those looks out of his blue eyes which he had before now found to be so irresistible. Of course the young lady immediately asked him why, and of course Clinton replied, Can you ask me? And this time he managed to sigh as he spoke. Jeanie blushed, and her little heart began to flutter with delight. She was becoming only too much in earnest in these occasional meetings, while to Clinton it was all a pretty little game, which just kept his hand in for more serious business. She could think of nothing to say, however, except another remark of, I wonder where Papa can be. He will turn up in good time, said Clinton quietly, and then he placed some of the blue gum leaves he was playing with in her hand, and managed to give it a meaning pressure while he did so. It was beginning to grow quite dark beneath the trees, Perhaps that was the reason Clinton had to bend down so near to see his companion's face. Neither of them had spoken for some minutes. At last Jeanie made a violent effort, and her first words broke the spell, for her companion at least. I really must go back, she said. Effie and Lucy will wonder what has become of me. It was so dusk that she scarcely noticed Clinton's sudden start. Is Miss Cunningham here tonight? he inquired, and Jeanie was conscious that there was a change in his tone. Yes, she said innocently. Why do you ask like that? Don't you like her? I like her, replied Clinton, really for once feeling confused by this inquiry, and thankful that she could not distinctly see his face in the dusk. Why, yes, of course I do. Everyone does, don't they? But I had no idea you had any visitors. Perhaps after all we had better go and see if Mr. Lennox is in the house. Jeanie got up at once, feeling disappointed and conscious that in some way, for her, the pleasure of the evening was over. Could she have done anything to offend him? She put on her hat, and Clinton did not offer to tie the strings, as she had expected that he would, 
and as they walked back very soberly and formally down the gully, something extremely like tears were glittering in her pretty eyes. But she kept her head carefully turned from her companion, and he was feeling too provoked with himself at the mistake he had unconsciously made to notice anything unusual about her. The lamp was not yet lighted when they entered the drawing-room, and Lucy and Effie were still seated by the window. Only the outlines of their two figures were visible, however, in the twilight. Clinton had by this time perfectly regained the command of himself. He contrived, while shaking hands with Lucy, to whisper to her that he was feeling dreadfully bored, and so glad that she was there to put him to rights again. Of course she was pleased with the compliment from her lover, what girl would not have been? And, though Clinton had been flirting with Jeanie all the evening, it was not such an insincere speech after all. Jeanie was the prettiest of playthings, for a time, but she had not Lucy's intelligence and piquancy, or her power of keeping those in whose society she was interested and amused by her conversation. Clinton was thoroughly alive to this, and on that evening he managed to make Lucy understand that he was aware of it, in a manner which set to rest the unformed doubt at her heart for a while. But there was somewhat at hand which was to drive away all minor troubles just then. The next day Effie drooped. They thought she had taken cold with sitting too long by the window while the dew was falling. Bronchitis came, bringing with it much suffering, borne with exceeding patience. Then, in a lull of the battle, Effie became aware that she was dying. It was about six o'clock in the evening, and Lucy was with her. She could speak a little, and she spoke of Jeanie. Jeanie will want me, she said, somewhat wistfully. What will she do without me? Oh, Lucy, you are stronger than she is. Will you help her? Always, for my sake, do take care of Jeanie. Lucy answered, I will. God helping me, do not fear for Jeanie. It was a solemn vow, destined to be solemnly redeemed, far sooner than she had any idea of then. When Effie spoke again, it was in a perfectly satisfied tone. Her last anxiety was gone. She said that nobody must grieve for her. She was very happy, knowing on whose love she rested. At the end of the week, she died. Her figure fades away from among the characters of mystery, and henceforth her place is vacant. Her life was a very short one, not remarkable in any manner, but her influence on Lucy Cunningham did not die with her. If Effie Lennox had lived, she might have continued to love Lewis Cunningham, and that love would have been utterly hopeless. The shadow, lying lightly on her life then, might have grown very dark within the years to come, but, dying when she did, Effie escaped all this. It had grown to be with her. If I had lived, I cannot tell I might have been his wife. But all these things have ceased to be with my desire of life. She was not to have her portion in this present world, but doubtless God had prepared some better thing for her. End of chapter 12 Recording by Lewis Fletcher